As you take your seats, I'm delighted that you're here. Again, I want to extend a very warm welcome. Thank you to our praise and worship team. Would you give them a hand? Would you do that? Amen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I want to give a shout out to our media team who uh, braves the weather every weekend, whether it's sunny, it's always early, and they're here faithfully to get things done. I got just a little bit of feedback going on. I know you're working on it, so. Uh, and I thank God for our Kids Point ministry. Would you give them a hand? Come on. Amen. Thankful for that and most appreciative of our helps ministry. Would you give them a hand? Amen. And it is all encompassing. It is, it is a lot of work. And if you don't think so, that's because you haven't volunteered lately. Come on now. I just thought it was always like this, not without work. Yeah, I'll try that again. Not without work. Amen. Yeah, the blessing of the Lord many times comes in looking like blue jeans and overalls. Rarely does it come from just thinking somehow or another that, ooh, you know, boy, I want to do what he does. You need to watch that movie a little bit closer. You don't just go to the theater and, and watch it. You need to buy it and take it home if you think ministry is easy. It is not. It is challenging, filled with challenges. And today we are here to commission uh, and appoint uh, some men and women of God into the full-time ministry, as it were. Uh, even if they don't have, especially if they don't have a church, they're still ministers. Long before my wife and I started pastoring, we were ministers of the gospel and nobody knew it. Nobody cared but us. And God. God did care. Amen. I want to take an opportunity to welcome our YouTube audience. Thank you so much for tuning in with us. We appreciate it. We know that you're not here by accident. We know that however you got here, it has been by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Today, we're going to have a unique service. It is going to be appointing some men and women of God to the, to the ministry as ordained ministers. So with that in mind, get something to write with. Take some notes. Maybe you're called to the ministry and you don't know it. Maybe you're looking for a church that does things like this. There are still churches that do this. As a matter of fact, it's not just seminaries. Amen. We'll tell you more about that in a minute. But thank you for tuning in. For those of you that might be watching via live stream that are partners with this ministry, get warm, get cozy, but make sure you stay awake just like you would if you were here. Amen. <laughs> Don't let the snow cause you to fall asleep. We love the people of God. And would you, if you agree with that, would you say amen? amen. We're thankful for our first time guests. Thank you for those of you that have come. We appreciate you. Come on, give them a round of applause. Amen. Thank you for coming out. And braving the weather, it is significant. I want you, if you would, to turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy 6. I will not belabor the time and I will not waste your time. We do have a couple of things we need to do after this. We're going to give a charge to orders. My brother, uh, Tony, the evangelist Tony Armstrong, uh, is going to be here. These are three of my closest friends on the planet right here sitting on this front row. And so I'm delighted that they're here, even if they're held hostage by snow and canceled flights and, you know, bad highways. But they'd be here anyway. Amen. Jack and Lynn live here. Y'all didn't know that, but they do. They secretly have a house here. <laughs> they just haven't told you where it's at. So y'all don't come over there. Amen. But I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So but at any rate, we're certainly delighted that you are here. Uh, I want to just set a stage real quick so that those of you that may not know what we're doing, uh, I'm talking to the ministers today. Uh, Y'all going to be standing and sitting quite a bit, but for just sake of today, I want all of the ones, candidates for ordination, just stand to your feet real quick so everybody can recognize and see who you are. Amen. Yeah, you show them some love. Amen. You can sit back down. Go ahead and take your seats. Amen. So, but I'm primarily directing that focus to them. But there may be some of you who uh, have a desire for ministry, a greater desire. Uh, so you need to be listening up and taking good notes as well. But those of you that have no aspiration, no desire for ministry, you'll probably just want to listen real good and just say, OK, amen. I'm not understanding, but you will. I want to tell you, I said that in the, in the opening and I say it intentionally. Uh, we have because of our society and because of the, the, the religious intention of man, uh, we have caused the ministry to be something that I believe that God never intended for it to be. And God never intended to, to, for it to be a glamorous position. God never intended for people to have their favorites. 
Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul in one place says that, who am I? He says, Apollos uh, plants, I water, but God gives the increase. So who is Apollos? Who is, who, is, who is Paul? But the reality of it is, in our society, we've acted like the only people that can really get up and articulate the word of God are people who have a seminary degree or they have higher education. And I would submit to you that I can find enough evidence in the word of God that although those things are right, and I mean, excuse me, are good, they're not necessarily the way that God God chooses to use people. God uses, the, his word says, foolish things to confound wise people. How is it that God can use a donkey to get a prophet to listen to him? Are y'all going to help me this morning? We're going to look at each other. He, he uses things that just simply don't make sense. When dealing with one of his prophets, Elijah, the Bible says that there was a whirlwind and that there was an earthquake and there was a rumbling, but God was not in any of that. But there was a still small voice that came and that's where God was. And we've taken it and we've made a doctrine out of the small voice and the quietness. But I'm here to tell you that God has the capacity to get a message to each one of us, no matter where we are. And so it is not God's it is not God's responsibility to get the word to us. He's already done that. Come on, preachers. I need y'all listening this morning. God needs us to tune, fine tune our hearing and our ability to listen and hear because he's always speaking. And when he speaks, he's not wasting words. Amen. And so many people have have substituted the anointing for education. And I'm not talking about I'm not talking about I'm not, no, I'm clearly talking about ministerial education. And there are many, I know there's many gifted men and women of God who have many degrees behind their name and earn doctorates and earn masters. Oh, I get all that. But I'm here to tell you that I don't care how much you think you know, you don't know anything except you know that everything you know came from God. Amen. If you don't know that, you don't know anything. And there are men and women trying to stand up behind the sacred desk of the most high God and deliver a message that comes from the flesh instead of the spirit realm. And people's lives are not impacted or if they are impacted, they're impacted negatively because somehow or another, just like the writing of the Apostle Paul, where I asked you to turn, people have itching ears wanting to hear a word that makes them feel good, but not cause them to be good. That's what we're doing today. I take this calling. My wife and I are very particular about this calling, extremely particular. We've always been that way because I grew up in a, in a, in a pastor's house and I strong, saw the struggles of my father, you know, a pastor. And I saw the struggles of my mother who gave their lives for the ministry. And I, I had a saying that I kind of had to get away from that I would never sacrifice my life on the altar of anybody's ministry. And the Lord said, what about mine? And knowing God the way I do, he doesn't want me to sacrifice my life. He wants me to have abundant life. But the only way to have abundant life is to be able to release everything to him and know that he's in charge. All I got to do is learn how to listen and obey. Have you found the scripture yet? First Timothy six, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. Many of those witnesses right now are not in this room, but they are in heaven. And the angels of the Lord are taking notice of what's going on. You better believe that. Okay. He says, verse 13, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things or makes alive all things. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, verse 14, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate. That's a very big word, but it is worthy. He is the only king, the only worthy one. He is the only emperor and ruler of all mankind. The king of kings and the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, who, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. I want to draw your attention there and keep you there just for a minute. The light that is being referred to is what has not been, you, you and I have not been drawn unto that yet. Let's read it again. I see some confused looks. I'm going to make sure I make it clear for you. Amen. Verse 16, who only hath immortality. Still talking about God, isn't that right? 
dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. Now, you and I live in the light. Amen. We have been born from darkness and translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. But there is a light that is being referred here by Paul that only comes for those who have committed and surrendered their lives that you may not see until you finish the course that God has for you. See, because see, this light is not approachable because if it was approachable in the earth realm, what would happen is people would start trying to bottle it up and manufacture it and somehow or another, you know, make it commercial so that you can say, well, I saw this light and I saw God. And we've had we've had countless uh, 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 doctrines of devils and demons and and religious disorder, not order. And people, <clears throat> excuse me, because I'm going to say it, people like Joseph Smith and some of these other people, you know, Hare Krishna and, and all these other ones, Sung Young Moon, that say that they saw something. Jim Jones said he saw something and 900 people lost their lives. So, 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 so this light only comes because you have had a face to face encounter with God, knowing that I, God, I have nothing to offer but my obedience. But if you can use nothing, here I am. Amen. So we, we, we aspire. Paul says we aspire unto that light. So let's let's look at a couple things here just for understanding. Amen. The, the, the word fight here in, in the Greek, it refers to a contest. Right. And it has the connotation of like the Olympic Games. You know, and, 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 and again, ministers, stay with me now to you have to. It also implies a contending with adversaries. Yeah, let me keep let me be me this morning. Is that OK? I, you know, I got up this morning. We, we, yesterday when 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 our dear friends, when we got a chance, they came in on Friday and we heard the warning of snow. <laughs> you know, I, we've been doing this for more than 24 hours. So, you know, we come from a faith camp. You know, Dr. Savelle has, has imparted into each and Miss Savelle has imparted into each one of our lives from a long way back. And so what we did in all of us, we got together and started rebuking snow. <laughs> and people have walked up in the house they were like what's wrong with y'all I, you know what's wrong with me? I can't stand snow Hallelujah. Leah, I just don't like it I don't own skis I don't have a snowboard I don't have a I don't have a ski do or you know what I'm saying so so snow really I know it's beneficial and necessary for the earth and it's part of the seasonal transition but I don't like it and so we started doing the ridiculous. But see, when we are contending with an adversary that cannot be seen by the eye, but has to be understood in the spirit realm, he's not going to put one over on me. And the Bible says in Matthew 18 that there, if two of us can get together, <laughs> if two of us can come to a place of believing, see what we what we, we learn, see, we can't talk about the snow and then rebuke it and bind it too. come on now. And as ministers of the gospel, you have to understand that your adversary has mocked your lives for destruction. You, you thought you were under attack before, baby. You ain't seen nothing yet. And there's no place of fear there because ultimately you have to know who you are in Christ Jesus. Am I right about it? And, and so... So yesterday we had, you know, we, we took care of the snow and, and you know, and, and you, know, you know, I mean, I got eyes too. My hands get cold too, that's why I wear gloves. Feet get cold, you know what I'm saying? And so the enemy's like, I thought you said, I thought you bound the snow, I did. Shut up. <laughs> well, how come it came? That's not my job. Oh, let me stop, let me, let me keep going, let me keep going. Let me, let, y'all right? So, so what we're doing is we're entering into a contest to contend, right, with adversaries and you are going to, if you didn't know before, if you thought that you were, uh, 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 you thought you were, I'll use the word pugilist, you know, uh, we, were, we were somewhere uh, yesterday as, just going out to lunch and we saw these old gloves, you know, uh, hanging on the wall and they looked like they was from 1920s, you know what I'm saying, they were just little bitty gloves and, and it looked like a, it was a kid's glove, you know how them old gloves, if you didn't know anything about boxing back in the day, now they got those big ginormous gloves and all that, kind of, but they had them little bitty, barely had any leather on them gloves. And we saw one of those hanging up. You might you might have been able to use that glove back in uh, 1892. 
But nowadays you're going to have to have a, a, a weapon that looks that is that is ginormous in its appearance. It is it's going to be have to be a glove that's covered in the blood and covered in prayer. And you have weapons that the Bible says he teacheth my hands to fight and my fingers to war. You're going to have to learn how to fight your adversary and defeat him every time he raises his head. He gets his head up. You need to put your foot down. If you want to talk to him, just what? Everybody lift your foot up and say what? Is he under your feet or is he just, we just talking about it? Glory to God. So we move on. Let's go on. Let's go on. The good fight. The good fight. Say good. See, because our connotation of good it's not always, most of our connotation, my wife was saying something about it in prayer about the soulish realm. Most of our connotation is good is based on what we've either seen, heard, heard or felt that seemed good. You know, you know, I, I'm just I'm just being honest, you know, th th there's not been a lot of good in the natural realm that I can see and ascribe to it if I use worldly vision. It's somehow or another, I think that if I'm uh, if, if I'm misconstrued in being a minister and I think that all ministers are poor or supposed to be poor, we got problems. Because the, the, the minister shouldn't be the one driving the worst car. Smith Wigglesworth used to say that, Lord, I'll serve you. But if when my shoes get run over at the heel, I'm done. Y'all ain't going to say amen. Let me go to this side. Y'all need to be saying amen. He said that if I, if I ever have to go out and my shoes have holes, we're done, Lord. Come on, Lord. Come on now. now, that's a bold statement for somebody to make. But that's the same somebody that raised countless people from the dead. Yes. And when you know your God, you can be bold like that. And I say to all of you, don't get up here. I told you yesterday when we had our interview, if you can do anything else in the world, do it. Don't do ministry. Because the same people that are with you this Sunday will talk about you next. Amen. Amen. Just want to make sure it's still on. So our good is not based on our feelings. You're going to have to let your feelings dry up. God will keep you in what I'm going to call a holding pattern until you mature up and grow up and shut up. I wish I could get some help in here this morning. People want to stand and they want to preach or they want to go to prisons. Go to the prisons. Go to the streets. Go there, but you better know that your devil knows that you're there. And you better go with a word in your mouth and certainty in your heart. Knowing full well, the apostle Paul said, I know in whom I have believed. And that he is able to keep that which I commit unto him against that day. You've got some things that people are going to expect to hear from you that are going to change their lives. But it's not going to work for them unless it works for you first. Uh, I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. That's all right. I don't need it. I keep going. Yes, sir. The good that is referred to here, the Greek word, talks about something, listen now, that is beautiful, yes. handsome, and excellent. Say that with me, please. Excellent. excellent. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It, 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 it talks about being beautiful to look at. When ministry is done the right way, it is beautiful to look at. Glory to God. Because you see people filled, filling the altars and you see people there just, you know, some of y'all first timers, y'all may not appreciate this, but I'm going here anyway. You stay with me. We'll be all right. You got snot coming out of orifices and liquid coming out of places because people are down on their face before God, not concerned about pride, not concerned about who does the altar call, not concerned about who preaches the message, but recognizing that in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. When God comes around, when God really shows up in a group of people who get it, next thing you know, people are having to step over one another and just leave her there because she's being cleansed by the power of the blood of Jesus. Don't mess with him. Leave him alone. You don't know that he just got off meth. He just came out the halfway house. They had, they had sentenced him to go to prison and God changed the sentence. Help me somebody. That's what good looks like. Good looks like God taking somebody off the, off the street and walking the stroll and looking for a quick buck. Good looks like a, a, a dealer turning in his drugs and saying, oh my God, what must I do to be saved? That's what good looks like. Good doesn't look just showing up to church. Help me, Lord. 
You all right? Yes. <laughs> Goes on to say beautiful by reason of purity. We need to become people of purity. Chastity. <laughs> oh, my brothers and sisters, y'all have to hear me now this morning, okay? Because some of y'all have been good, and I'm talking again to some of y'all ministers. I don't know your past. I don't want to know your past. You should not care about your past other than to say, look what the Lord has done. I'm not turning around to look, but when you look at me and you see me, look, you, look, you have to look, you see what's behind me because I'm not turning around. And so somebody like myself and my wife who were, who were really not qualified to be here in front of you today, we just weren't qualified because we weren't called. <laughs> Help me somebody. But the apostle Paul writes whom he calls, he qualifies. And so not many noble, not many mighty, not many strong after the flesh. But but again, God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So when the call comes, you either answer or you disobey. <laughs> A lot of people like to disobey. Disobedience, disobedience in this realm costs you nothing. Disobedience in this realm lets you sleep in instead of coming to church. Disobedience in this realm to the call. God's not going, don't, don't believe the lie. Don't believe the hype that God, God took him out because he was disobedient. God don't take nobody out. That's right, that's right. Preach it. I said God doesn't take anybody out. That's part of that seminary teaching. I ain't hating, I'm telling the truth. If God wanted to get you, he'd have got you before you knew that he wanted to get you. And you look up, oh, I've been got. And you don't even make a good puff of smoke. You feeling me? But rather what God does is he makes allowance in our lives because he understands that we are just frail human beings. We, we are flesh and blood that has been his supernatural power has come upon us and it makes us the superman, the superwoman of God. You can't do anything except that empowerment come. So if you ever forget who gave you the power, you become ordinary Clark Kent or, 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 or what was his girlfriend's name, you know, Lois Lane. Thank you all for being with me. Lois Lane is looking and she sees Clark Kent, but God looks and sees Superman not yet in the booth. He sees that Wonder Woman who has to go and she's incognito because she looks like just an ordinary sister. But when the empowerment of God shows up, the next thing you know, she's casting out devils and taking authority over the spirits of darkness. Can I get an amen in this place? God likes to clean your mess up so he can make you look good for him. Well, you know, I don't want to do that. That's fine because over here it costs you nothing or so we think. But somehow or another, the, 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 the absence of God's judgment in this life seems to not affect us until we get close to death or we cross over. And then we have the ability of no longer having, the Apostle Paul says in one place, the vanity of my mind, or Solomon wrote, the vanity of my mind in Ecclesiastes 3. It is all vanity. In other words, when my eyes are really open and my ears are in tune to the spirit of the living God, I know that when I wake up in the morning, I'm just an ordinary guy, but I am not just ordinary in the natural. I am, I am, not, I am a supernatural. I am ordinary to the eyes of people, but to the eyes of God, I am his chosen. Help me somebody. Woo, he loves me. He loves me. Come on, not just preachers, y'all need to say he loves me. He loves you enough that he carried whatever you had to go through, he was carrying you. Whatever you've dealt with, you thought you couldn't take no more. He said, come here, baby, I got you. Come here, son, I got you. He's carrying you. Yeah. Yeah. Apostle Paul understood that concept. So he could tell his son Timothy, who was his protege, he said, listen, faith, fight the good fight of faith. I heard Brother Copeland say years ago that faith, the good fight of faith is the faith that you what? Win. It ain't a good fight until I win. And I might have to go more than 12 rounds. It is okay. Because I'm not, that's right, it ain't over till God says it's over. And God ain't going to say it's over until I win. 
If I've got to face a physical challenge, whether it be cancer or diabetes or any other uh, malady, if I got to stand until they're wheeling me, trying to wheel me out and say, put him on this floor because he got no more life. Baby, you may not see it, but there's something kicking and screaming on the inside of me that is tenacious enough to say, God, if it's not over, I don't care if I weigh 10 pounds. I don't care if my organs begin to shut down. You are God. What do you say? Fight the good fight. My God, God, I think we've, we've raised a generation of spiritual wimps personally. Not in this church. I think we've gotten a little lazy in our, in our, in our confession and in our life. Of, I think we've gotten to the point where we think that, you know what, it's, whatever I offer God is okay. Now, that might be something that the body does, but it better not ever come out of any of y'all. Not only is God watching, I'm watching. Ministers shouldn't be late to appointments. Ministers shouldn't skip prayer. (laughs) Ministers should not go a week without being in the word. Ministers shouldn't get their notes and their messages from their secretary. Tell me how much you know the Greek and the Hebrew. How much time do you spend it on your face? (laughs) Uh, I want my preacher to dress this way. Well, you go buy you one. (laughs) Let me start. Let me. Let me. Y'all. Y'all. All right. (laughs) Y'all. Okay. Let me. Let me move on. Turn. I'm having too much fun, but that's okay because that's what we do. See, see, with, with, in the faith realm, it is the conviction of truth of anything. That's what the word means. Conviction of the truth of anything. Belief. In the New Testament, it speaks of a conviction or belief respecting, I like that word, man's relationship to God. Hmm. My, my relationship to God is that he is the giver of all things. James writes, he says, listen, he says, don't let a man say that when he is tempted, he is tempted of God, for God does not tempt man with evil. In other words, God can't do evil in your life. He can't do it. Where are he going to get it from? Where God going to get evil from? How's he going to do that? Well, God, you know, you heard people say, or somebody say not too long, well, you know, uh, God must have let me break my leg to teach me something. You're a fool. You're misinformed. Come on, come on, come on now. Well, the, the, the cancer is teaching me something. What is it teaching you? How to die? Come on now. And it would be funny if it wasn't so serious. Somebody, somebody need to be telling somebody you can live. I will live and not die, the psalmist says, and declare the works of the Lord. Relating to God, relating to Christ. Mm-hmm. Relating to Christ, a strong and welcome conviction or belief that Jesus is the Messiah through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. These things sound so elementary, but you know what? I challenge you to go. This is the only church I go to on Sundays. I challenge you to go out here and hear, hear are people still talking about salvation? Are people still talking about holiness, righteousness, the blood of Jesus, the Holy Ghost? Are they? I don't know. If they're not, they're lying to you. Mm, Y'all can't do that. Y'all can't do that. And you sure ain't going to do it here. You got people sitting out that will challenge you on that one. They challenge me, they're going to challenge you too. (laughs) Belief (laughs) Belief with the predominant idea of trust or confidence in God, in Christ, springing from the faith in him. Mm, That's so good. I'm going to say it one more time. Belief. This is faith. Belief with the predominant idea of trust or confidence in God or in Christ, which springs from faith in either one in them. Amen. Turn to 2 Timothy 4. Get out your way. How much time I got? Thank you, Father. 2 Timothy 4. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, say "Thank thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. 2 Timothy 4. You know, when, when I, you know, what I do when we just, as you hold your place there, what we do, um, and this rose up in me, um, 
uh, this morning as I was showering, um, you know, the devil talks to me. I, I know his voice from God. And he said, you know, um, and it, uh, because a decision has to be made to cancel service uh, sooner than you think. It has to be made right around 530 in the morning because these guys are out here early and other things are going on. It wouldn't be fair for me to cancel service at 7 o'clock and they already out here said no. Right. Right. You feeling me? So I, I was up and uh, yeah, I wasn't up because I was distressed. I just happened to be up and, and uh, you know, I looked at my phone and, and saw some of the sister churches and other churches that were canceling service. And uh, you're blessed. And uh, the Lord said, uh, what are you going to do? I said, what do you mean? He said, are you going you to cancel? This is what the Lord said. I said, no, sir, I'm not going to cancel. He said, do you know why you're not going to cancel? I, I, you know, and when God asks you a question like that, if you don't know, just say you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> don't act like you do and try to fool him. because, Right? He said, because there's people who've been waiting on this service their entire lives. Mm-hmm. 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 And how would it look if we just kind of punked out? Hey, no shame, no, no condemnation, you know, for people that couldn't make it. I get that. Most of y'all live close enough to be able to, to, to navigate whatever's going to come, whatever happens. But I'm just telling you, you know what? We ain't, ain't no punks in this house. You know, and you spend enough time in one of my leadership meetings, you'd be thinking that I'm crazy, but I am. But I know, I know God's desire. We ain't got enough preachers. I better keep going. Where did I tell you to turn? 2 Timothy 4? Let's read verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick or alive and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Do you see that? Do you see that there's two places of judgment there? At his appearing and at his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. I would say today would be an out of season day. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine or teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound teaching. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. Or another translation says lustful ears. Verse 4, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fantasies, fables, myths. But, he says to Timothy, I say to you, watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Not affliction, afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. Hmm. The word preach here has, uh, excuse me, has this connotation. Always with a suggestion or form of formality, gravity or seriousness, and in authority, which must be listened to and obeyed. I, I heard this a long time ago, and I heard the Lord say this this morning, but I'm a, I'll tell you that secondarily. But I heard the Lord say this a long time ago through one of the men in, of God that I follow. And he said, when you go as the shepherd of a church or the leader of a ministry, when you hit the door, leave you on the outside. Walk in with your head held high and your shoulders square. And walk in in the authority of God like a general on the battlefield. Now that's not arrogance, that's posture. That's prophesying before I even get up here to speak. Huh? And so what God said this morning as I was sitting here is that what you see are officers. Oh God help me this morning. In his service who have come to Inspect the troops, as it were. Amen. Ah, glory to God. <laughs> you know, so I don't know their rank. He does. But I know people, they don't like this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I don't like when they call Brother Copeland a general in the faith. Who cares what you like? When you influence your life and ministry influences as many millions of people as his has, maybe then you can say something. Yeah, 
Ha! Huh. So you don't want me to call him a general, but now I can't use the term apostle because it just don't seem to fit. I thought all the apostles died at the. Shut up. Study your Bible, more importantly. So that's what they're here for. And they did their job yesterday with y'all. I told them it was an interrogation, but there were some folks sweating in that chair. He said the fetal position. Amen. So preach with authority. Let's keep going. Are y'all right? Can I go a little bit further? Here in 1 Timothy 6, we'll go back there, but I'm going to read this from the message. The next couple passages are the same too, but I'm going to, and then I'm going to give you six steps and I'm going to get out of your way. 1 Timothy 6 and 11 from the message translation. And, you know, you might need to invest in some, something other than the King James to get understanding. <clears throat> Amen. It says running hard. First Timothy 6, 11 from the message translation says running hard. But you, Timothy, I'm going to say this. You, Kyle, you, Cynthia, you, Tommy, you, Caleb, you, Mike. Can I say that? Yes, sir. I know some of y'all ministers sitting out there don't want me to point to y'all, but that's okay. Today, day, day, your day coming. But you, man of God, woman of God, run for, for your life from all of this. Pursue a righteous life, a life of wonder, faith, love, steadfastness, or excuse me, steadiness and courtesy. I am, I am, I, I am peeved off. Some of y'all thought I was going to say something else. It is a pet peeve of mine when ministers are rude. Somehow or another, they think they got something more special, more special than, than everybody else. You don't. If you go out to eat, leave, a, leave the best tip. Stop being cheap. If you cheap, don't tell them you're from Life Point. You better hope they never come in the door and see you with your cheap self. Write something on the ticket. You need Jesus. That's your tip. <laughs> you need to repent if you write that. Anyway, run hard, he says, and fast in the faith. Seize, listen, the eternal life, the life you were called to, the life you so fervently embraced in the presence of so many witnesses. Ah, listen to me real quick here. Look up at me, you especially. Listen, it is one thing to start the race with energy and fervor but if you really want something long and lasting you stay faithful to the end yes. preach when they show up and most especially when they don't show up yes. I can preach to 10 people I can preach to 5 people I can preach to 2 people just like I'm preaching now yes. I have done it and will do it again and when she don't want to listen I'll preach to myself she always listens though. He says, I'm charging you before the life-giving God and before Christ who took his stand before Pontius Pilate. He didn't give an inch. Keep this command to the letter and don't slack off. Our master Jesus Christ is on his way. He'll show up right on time. His arrival is guaranteed by the blessed and undisputed ruler. Whoop, glory to God. High king, high God. He's the only one death can't touch. His light is so bright no one can get close. Help me, Jesus. Whoop. Glory to God. Come on, just lift your hands for a minute. I can't keep going without acknowledging that. Like, come on, just lift your hands. Just tell him, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the life. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in us. Can we extend that praise a little bit? Thank you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. You are so awesome, so amazing. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. He is the high king, the high God. He's the only one death can't touch. His light is so bright, no one can get close. He's never been seen by human eyes. Human eyes can't, uh, can't take him in. Honor to him and eternal rule. Oh, yes. 2 Timothy 4. This is from the Phillips translation. My time is nearly over, Paul says, verse 1. So you must carry on. He says, I urge you, Timothy, as we live in the sight of God and of Christ Jesus, whose coming in power will judge the living and the dead, I charge you to preach the word of God. Never lose your sense of urgency. In season and out of season, prove, correct, and encourage using the utmost patience in your teaching. If you ever aspire to one of the, and you should, <clears throat> five-fold ministry offices, I'm going to tell you, if you're called to be a pastor, you better learn patience before you get there. Yeah. Don't wait to get here and then try to be, learn patience. You know what God does? When we, ask for, when we ask God, God, teach me to be patient, he gives us, he allows all types of things that come that just irritate the, the <laughs> be Jesus out of you, I don't know. No, 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 no. He takes you to Walmart. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> he lets, he lets, he, he, it's not that he's the a source of these things, but he said, okay, you want patience. I can give you patience because I've already given you the Prince of Peace. But since you want me to give you patience, I'll just go ahead and back off and let your enemy teach you something. Yes. What, would God back off? Absolutely would. If the Bible says that they, they limit the Holy One of Israel, you know, or, or, or they, what, it, what the connotation is, is that they just handcuff him and he can't do anything. Right. But we take the handcuffs off and say, Father, thank you for patience. Thank you for the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit who has taught me patience and love and kindness. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Mm. A few more minutes. Y'all right? 2 Timothy 4 from the Philip's translation, he says, uh, verse 3 says, For the time is coming when men will not, in, it will not tolerate wholesome teaching. They will want something to tickle their own fancies. They will collect teachers who will pander to their own desires. They will no longer listen to the truth, but will wander off after man-made fictions. For yourself, stand fast in all that you do and that you're doing, meeting whatever suffering this may involve. Go on steadily preaching the gospel. Carry out the full commission. I like that. Full commission that God gave you. From the Amplified Bible, same passage. It's important enough for me to read these so you hear them. You need to be writing them down and go back and look at them yourself. Amen? Amen. I charge you in the presence of God. You heard what my wife said about the Amplified Bible. Sometimes it takes a little long, but that's okay. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. And by or in light of his coming and his kingdom, Amplified Bible says herald and preach the word. When I think of the word herald, I think of, you know, with the long, long flute, long bugle type instrument, you know, or a town crier. That's what you are. That's what you are. Most of your sermons may not come from this place. Come on now. You, you might have to take the message and probably will. And you should to a nursing home, to a convalescent home, to a senior assistant, to a jail, to a prison. Take the message and Man, a woman of God standing there with confidence, not arrogance, confidence. Amen. Amen. Keep your sense of urgency, he says. Stand by, be at hand and ready, whether the opportunity seems to be favorable or unfavorable, whether it is convenient or inconvenient, whether it is welcome or unwelcome. You as preacher of the word are to show people in what way their lives are wrong. Stop needing friends. Stop needing the validation of people. It needs to end today. Amen. They're going to tell you. And they ain't going to invite you to the church. Not unless you, not unless you follow their doctrine. How, how long they ask you to tell you that you had to preach? What did you tell me the other day? Say again. 20 minutes. Gave her 20 minutes to preach. I can't even say hello in 20 minutes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That doesn't mean you turn down the invitation. But you don't. They tell you to preach 20. Don't go 25. I'm going to tell you something about this, too. I'm going to tell you something about this. Y'all going to learn a lesson. All y'all going to learn a lesson. I preached for about 45 minutes to an hour, okay? And I've, I've whittled it down so we could have ministry time. Today's a little bit longer because we got something special. But you can't preach longer than me. Right. Amen. Not up here. And you sure can't preach something I don't preach. 
Now, these ministers already know that because I tell them this in our meetings. Say amen to that. Amen. Come on now. If you go into a church, they invite you into a church and they tell you that they don't want you talking about Holy Ghost. Don't you dare override the authority of that house. You will be in error. Well, I just felt like I had to say it. You're still in error and you need to repent. OK. 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 He goes on to say whether it's convenient, inconvenient, whether it is welcome or unwelcome, you as a preacher of the word or to show people what way their lives are wrong. Convince them, rebuking and correcting. If some of y'all got rebuked, y'all would never show your face again in a church. I ain't looking at nobody. I'm looking at my paper. (laughs) Warning and urging and encouraging them, being unflagging, inexhaustible in patience and teaching. For the time is coming. If Paul wrote in this century that the time was coming, you know the time is here. When people will not tolerate or endure sound and wholesome instruction, but having ears itching for something pleasing and gratifying, they will gather to themselves one teacher after another to consider uh, to a considerable number chosen to satisfy their own liking and to foster the errors that they hold. Mm. We, one, one of the things that we have is a board meeting. We didn't have it yesterday because we ran out of time, but we have one annually. I recently updated, <clears throat> at the direction of the Holy Spirit, my wife and I, updated and upgraded our bylaws and our article of incorporation. One of the reasons why I had to do it is because of the climate that we are now in that has, listen, has taken root, not just in Iowa, but all over the world, all over the planet, has taken root where the spirit of witchcraft, <clears throat> witchcraft and lesbianism and homosexuality is now taking root to the point where it, it, it intimidates this desk. Y'all gonna hear me this morning. I don't preach against anything that is not in the word. And I don't preach against anything anyway. I tell my job and your job is to tell the truth. Let the truth and the truth interpreter, Holy Ghost, Let him do the convicting, not you. But if that spirit should show up in here, it's going to hear the truth. I don't care if it's a spirit of that, what I mentioned, whether it's a spirit of of hatred, whether it's a spirit of anger, jealousy, envy, lying, stealing, it's all going to hear the truth. And it must be dealt with because when truth comes forth, it must be acknowledged. And a choice is made. I don't want to do the truth. I want to do what I want to do. That is not your job beyond that. Say amen, somebody. He goes on to say, verse 4, he says, and will turn aside from hearing the truth and wander off into myths and man-made fictions. As for you, be calm (laughs) and cool and steady, accept and suffer unflinchingly every hardship. Hardships come with the territory. You don't have to go looking for it. It's going to show up. We had, a, we had a conference a year or so ago and uh, had a, some ministers from North Carolina that were here. And we were at the, at the uh, Clarion up in, up in the northern part or eastern part of the city, and uh, Iowa City. And um, the, the ministers were getting in my car, my wife and I's car. And they were in, and the car wouldn't start. I was hot as fire, but I was calm on the outside. And that car wouldn't move. It didn't move for two or three days, did it? It didn't move. So I had to get them out, put them out. You know, embarrassment, but embarrassment's only there if you got an ego. I would have to in, have intended to do that in order for me to be embarrassed. I couldn't control it. Are you hearing me? Come on, we got to get this stuff. He says to them, do the work of an evangelist. Now, in this passage, evangelist is a bringer of good tidings. That's why I said what I just said. I'm not going to stand up and tell somebody, well, you, you know, you, you, know you, uh, you need to change your lifestyle. Your lifestyle's bad. First of all, I don't know. They don't know what's in my lifestyle. Right. Yeah. What you doing? If I don't want them to ask me what I'm doing, I sure ain't going to ask them what they're doing. Are y'all hearing me? Am I boring you? Come on. 
Rather, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the work of an evangelist. I'm going to bring good time. Man, Jesus is alive. He loves you just like you are. You know, wait, wait, wait. You don't have to clean yourself up. He's already taken care of that. He's already shed his blood. He's already healed you. Good news. Healing is the children's bread. If you're poor, you ain't got to be poor no more. For my God will lavishly give you all things and has given you all things that pertain unto life. That's good news. Let me give you these six steps and I'll make them brief and get on out your way. We're going to have my brother come up and, and these ministers are going to lay hands on these ones. Six steps. And I, 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 I didn't steal it from Brother Copeland. We were at conference a couple weeks ago and, and uh, Brother Jerry was there and, and Richard Roberts and David Blunt, the ones speaking, and they were talking about how they steal each other's message. I think, you know, wait a minute now. The Bible says let him that steal, stole, steal no more. So I just borrowed it. <laughs> Just saying. I just borrowed the message, okay, uh, from Brother Copeland. But it blessed me so good back in early 90s, and it's still relevant today. So I'm going to give you the six steps he gave. Y'all ready for them? You have to write fast. Six steps. Huh? Don't talk fast. If I don't talk fast, I might put somebody to sleep. <laughs> My wife. I'm from New York, y'all. I mean, you know. Six steps to success in ministry. Number one, dedication. Dedication. Dedication is the act of consecrating to a divine being or to a sacred use. You guys are consecrating your lives to a sacred use and already have consecrated your lives to a divine being. Isn't that right? Because if you didn't, you wouldn't be here this morning. Now, how, how, how can he use you? You need to ask him that question. How can you use me, Lord? Amen? That's dedication. Number two, singleness of purpose. Singleness of purpose. Purpose, purpose. That which a person sets before themselves, himself or herself, as an object to be reached or accomplished. Some of y'all aspiring to the ministry. We're getting ready. I don't know. I'm not going to give you a date on it because we still are not there, but we're getting ready to start up our minister's training class again. So keep your ears to the wind. Hear the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. Get ready. That which a person sets before himself or herself as an object to be reached or accomplished. When, my, when our daughter passed away <clears throat> back in 2004, and uh, uh, Dr. Savelle's daughter, Terry Savell, Terry Savell Foy, who has her own ministry and is doing well, amen, um, she walked up to my wife and I and she said, Tommy, Lynette, what do you want, you know, for your ministry? And without hesitation, I said, I want a million, one million souls for every year she lived on this earth. Amen. That's 18 million people. Amen. Amen. Singleness of purpose. Yes. It, gets, it gets me out of the bed sometimes. It, it makes me get in the word. And, and I mean, you, just, you say, well, you need something to make you. Ministry many times is exhausting. Yes. It's, it can be frustrating because you don't see the results that you're looking for. Yes. So you better have signals of purpose. You better have something to get you out of bed every day. Yes. Amen? Amen? You shouldn't wait to get on your knees when trouble strikes. Yes. It says being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. You can just write that Ephesians 1 and 11 down. That's where that comes from. Amen? So singleness of purpose. Number three. I think if there's any that are, is more important than others, what I've learned in my own personal life is number three. Obey the Holy Spirit. Amen. Obey Holy Spirit. Obey Holy Ghost. Saying, Acts 5, 28. You can write it down. Saying, Acts 5, 28. Did, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Man, I want to fill Iowa City Amen. with faith. I want to fill the region with faith. Oh, my God. I can see it. If we're going to get, if 18 million going to come into the kingdom, well, you know what? They ain't going to just come because I traversed the globe. My assignment is here primarily. Glory to God. Mm. They said that you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine or your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. I certainly do. I intend to bring the blood of Jesus to him, Mike. Come on now. I want him to know what you know. How many of y'all healed in here? 
while your hand's not out of your hand, and it should be even if you ain't, even if you don't feel like it, that's the time you, I'm healed. Intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. <laughs> Glory to God. Ooh, ah. Number four, very important. Leave the world behind. Leave the world behind. If what you're doing doesn't line up with God, you need to leave it behind. Uh oh. If you got somebody in your life that does not line up with the future plan of God for your life, you need to leave them behind. Oh, I can't leave her. I can't leave him. Look, God hates idolatry. The Bible says there's six things that the Lord hates, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And idolatry is right there in the midst. And it is easy to make things idols and call it family or job or responsibility. And it becomes an idol in the sight of God. Help me somebody. Man of God, woman of God, God call you better know it's him. God call you off that job and you refuse to let go because you look at the salary of the job greater than you look at the call of God. You are not fit for the kingdom of God. I didn't say it. Jesus said it right here. Verse Luke 9, verse 60. He says, Jesus refused first things first. Your business is life, not death. And life is urgent. He says, announce God's kingdom. Verse 61. Then another said, I'm ready to follow you, master. But first, excuse me while I get things straightened out at home. You're not worthy till you get it right in the house. Does that mean I don't have problems? My wife and I got plenty of problems, but we got it right in the house. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Tony, that's a good, right in the house. Amen. Got preachers up here, that, 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 and I'm not here, but you got preachers behind the desk of the, of the Almighty, what I call sacred, and they out here and got a woman on the side. How many adults I got in here? I got to make sure I got adults in here. Who's the youngest person in here? We got adults in here. Yeah, right, Jim. Okay, yeah, I see. Some of y'all missed a good opportunity. Spend time in the wrong places. I'm going to say it so you might as well ready to study yourself. Preachers masturbating at home. And bringing that trash into, into, unto their wives and expecting their wives to do that dirty deed. You need to repent yes. Come on. and wonder why the power of God doesn't flow through your life. Tall, Women of God who have not learned how to identify what does or does not look good in public. Come on. Come on. I don't want to see your body and you trying to teach me something. Oh, I ain't going to get no amens that I told y'all. Clean it up. Dress it up. Bring the word. What you wear at home is your business. Not in the house of God. And that spirit of Jezebel and rebellion has come not to roost here because I'm not going to have it. But roost in the house of God. And next thing you know, you got all kinds of confusion and church splits going on. Because you got a bunch of weak, need, jelly back preachers. Won't confront anything. Help us, Lord. Well, I didn't come for this. Should have. This other person said, verse 61, then another said, I'm ready to follow you, Master, but first, excuse me, while I go, get things straightened out at home. 62, Jesus said, no procrastination. No backward looks. You can't put God's kingdom off till tomorrow. Seize the day. Carpe diem, baby. Seize the day. Tomorrow's not promised to anybody. Somebody in this room might not know it, but you might be in heaven this time next week. I don't know. Ain't gonna be me. Because I know my purpose. Right. 
verse number five. I'm just going to give it to you. I'll give you a scripture. I'm not going to read it. Study the word day and night. Study the word day and night. Study the word day and night. Now, Pastor Ness said it, you know, I mean, it's hard. But it's necessary. And don't be don't get legalistic on me. Don't get legalistic. Well, you, you, you might be the person in your house that cooks the meals because you have other responsibilities in your house. But you ain't cooking because you got to read the word. No, you need to cook the meal. If it's your responsibility to cook the meal, cook the meal. And don't put it off on the word. Well, I got to study. They said I got to study. He's got to study day and night, study day and night. And you, you, you are a spiritual fruitcake. Ain't nothing happening. Ain't no good to nobody. I got to go to prayer. I mean, you need to, you need to take care of your family. Be ye male or female. I, 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 I wish. <laughs> I know it doesn't apply here, but maybe somebody listening might, might need a revelation, and I'm going to give it to you right now. Just because you're a woman of God don't mean that you withhold your body and your intimacy from your husband. And just because you're a man of God don't mean that you don't give to the wife what is due her. You ain't that spiritual. I did say that out loud, I'm sure, but the scripture for that, for studying the word, 2 Timothy 2, 15 through 22. I wrote down the New Living Translation. You can do the same. It's up to you. 2 Timothy 2, 15 through 22, New Living Translation for study the word. Lastly, number six, commit to fast and pray. Your time is going to be challenged in the ministry. And, and, and stop, stop, don't allow yourself the luxury of saying, well, you know, uh, I, I, I ain't going to go down to that church no more because all they do is use me. And then you got another group to say, well, you know, I'm not going to that church because all they do is abuse me. Then you got another group that says, well, you know, they don't use me down there. Which is it, use or not use? Yeah, we're going to use you. I said, yeah, we're going to use you. You're supposed to get used. You're a tool. That's you're a vessel. Right. Mm. Wish I had time, but that's okay. Commit to fast and pray. As they minister to the Lord, this is Acts 13, 2 through 5. Acts 13, 2 through 5. As you commit to fast and pray, as they minister to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they went away. Oh, excuse me, they sent them away so that, so that they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed unto Seleucia and from thence they sailed to Cyprus and when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews and they had also John to their minister. Can you say amen to that? The Bible says, I think it's the Apostle Peter wrote in one place that in a great house there are many vessels, some to honor and some to dishonor. And the choice of honor versus dishonor is up to you and I. Amen. How many of you want God to honor your life and your ministry? Can you say amen to that? I know I do. And I have to repent more than I care to admit. People say, well, you know, you shouldn't be sinning. Well, you, neither should you. But I guarantee if you live long enough, you're going to sin. If you live beyond today, you're going to commit a sin. It may not be intentional. I hope it ain't intentional. My dear brother had a challenge on the airplane coming here. He didn't sin. I know he might have wanted to set somebody straight. But he chose the high road. He said, God, you got this, because if I get this, somebody's going to be being carried off this plane, and it ain't going to be him. Big as that man is. Come on now. Got some little devil, little imp messing with him. Uh, and you know it is. That's what it is. That's what it is. These men were sent by God. They are most high God. Y'all remember that? Yeah. Kept following Paul. And they were preaching around and around. Finally, Paul said, enough is enough. <laughs> Go to hell. <laughs> Isn't that basically what he said? Much, yeah. Shut up. Yeah. Get out of her. But we get intimidated because our, our, our surroundings. He didn't, but he handled the rabble. Can you say amen? Come on, give, put your hands together and give the Lord a hand of praise. Would you do that?